Welcome once again to a noonday Bible class at Community Baptist Church in Santa Rosa, California, where our pastor is Reverend H. Lee, uh, Reverend Dr. H. Lee Turner. My name is Brother Jim Kennedy, and uh, Sister uh, Maria Dreyer is the one who uh, records these uh, messages. So I thank her when she types them out so you can follow along with us. Uh, so uh, we're going to start uh, in session four, and it's redirecting anger. And the passage is from Psalms 35, 1 to 3, and 13 through 18. So if you have your Bible, you can get ready and uh, follow along uh, with the scripture readings. And also, uh, so we, the prayer, our prayer request will. Uh, be for our church family, the pastor, and actually Turner. I pray for all the families out there and watching that uh, they keep safe and that uh, in our country, Lord, that will be uh, keep safe and uh, respect each other's uh, way of life. You know that uh, we don't. Uh, be without mass and that right there. I pray for our country as a whole, and uh, and uh, so and I pray for each one out there watching what what their needs are. So I'll start with scripture. We we'll read Psalms 103. It says, "Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless His holy name." Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfy your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his way to Moses, his acts of the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. For he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquity. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgression from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass and the flower of the field, so it flourish, for the winds pass over it and it is gone. And in its place remember it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels who excel in strength to do his will, healing, uh, heeding the voice of his word, Bless the Lord, all you, his host, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. And blessing be to the hearing and reading of Psalms 103. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we will bow in humble submission, coming to your throne of grace and mercy. Asking you to forgive us of all sin that we committed against thee, Lord. We ask that you cleanse us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Make us pure in thy sight, Lord, as we study your word today. Lord, let the Holy Spirit minister to our hearts and our minds and our souls, Lord, that we will go away knowing more than we did before we came, Lord, that we will know that we are doing your will and not ours, Lord. And Lord, we are on a topic of anger, Lord, uh, we pray that. Lord, that we never uh, uh, go to sleep with anger on our hearts, Lord, that uh, there never uh, hold anger within, Lord. We pray that you will give us the peace that only you can give us, Lord, and the understanding that comes only from you, Lord. 
We thank you for your many blessings. We give you the praise. We give you the honor and glory. And we pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay, we got, uh, like I said, uh, the section four, session four and redirecting anger. Question one is, uh, when you were a kid, what would make you really angry? So you can answer that right there. I used to remember when we'd be out playing, and some of the kid, one of the kids would have to leave, and I'll say we had to do something. Like they had to leave and watch a little program. It used to get me all angry, but you might have a different one. So anyway. The point is, take your anger to God and leave matter in his own hand. The passage is Psalms 35, 1, 3, 13 to 18. The Bible means that small children can get mad about the silliest thing. And if they catch us giggling, they only get madder. Parents report their children have gotten mad because the moon was in the sky during the day. The picture was, wasn't was in the uh her picture wasn't in the wedding album. Her ice cream was too cold. They wouldn't let him wipe his nose with a piece of bread. Unfortunately, we also get angry as adults and for equally the silly reasons. Some chew his food too loudly. Someone in front of you is walking and driving too slowly. Someone asked a question that was just answered moments ago. Someone puts you on hold for longer than a minute. A minute, you become angry over something petty, just like have, uh, just like I have, and other times more serious matters push the anger button, slander, threats, and unjust action. Uh, do we uh, give into anger, or is there a better way? In Psalm 35, David had good reason to be angry, but he took a different route. It's a route we should consider when angry starts to well up inside of us. Psalm 35, 1 and 3. Lead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of the shield and buckle and stand up for my help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that prosecute me and say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Many of us have played the game of one upmanship. We play it when we try to look better than the next person. We're taking a, a trip to Europe this summer. We also play a negative version of the game. You think you had it bad? Let me tell you how sick I was. You wouldn't. Uh, one, to play the game against King David. When it comes to opposition and roadblocks in life, David lost mostly, this mostly, uh, most likely would be far longer and greater than yours and mine. Opposition comes in many forms. We view everything that keeps us from what we want to think or deserve as opposition. And these things that can stir up anger in us ever gotten riled up because you couldn't find the TV remote? My point is, it doesn't take much to see something as opposition. But David faced real and serious opposition. David likely penned Psalm 35 during a period of his life when King Saul was pursuing him. After David's victory over Goliath, he quickly rose in popularity with the people. Uh, he served in Saul's court and he was successful in everything he did. David never sought to, to up, uh, use up King Saul, but uh, that was not how Saul viewed David. It didn't help that the popular song of that day was Saul has slain his thousand and David 10,000. That was in 1 Samuel 18, 7. God had all, uh, God's hand obviously, obviously, obviously was on David. Prophet Samuel already had informed Saul the kingdom shall not continue. Thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart 
and the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people. That's in 13 and 14. Even before his name, and before David's name was much set by 1830, after he killed Goliath 1745 to 52, and became successful in Saul's army, Samuel anointed him and declared that he was the one God had chosen to be the next king. And uh, that's in 16, 12, 13. Even though David remained loyal to Saul and served him faithfully, he eventually had to run for his life. From then until Saul's death, David lived in the wilderness. To have David out of his court and in public eyes was not enough for Saul. He relentlessly chased after David with a single mind intended to of killing him. Read the full account of Saul uh, on the velocity in 1 Samuel chapter 18 through 26. It is in this context that David cried out, plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me, fight against them that fight against me. The psalmist called an input uh, uh, psalms, imprecatory psalms, one in which the writer calls on God to bring harm and disaster on his enemy. Many people are uncomfortable with these psalms because they seem uh, diametrically opposed to Jesus' command to love our enemies, Matthew 5.44. At least we will, uh, think David is main, mean spirit with no love in his heart. Two things in David's life are worth knowing. One, David has an easy opportunity to kill his enemy twice. On one occasion, Saul went to relieve himself in the very cave where David and his men were hiding. David crept up and cut off the corner of Saul's robe to prove that he had Arms that he could have a harm soul, but he would never lift his hand against the one God has anointed. And that's verse Samuel 24, 1 through 11. Let's look at that. Verse Samuel 24. Samuel 24, 1 through 11. Okay, and it came to pass when Saul was returned from hauling the Philistine, and it was told to him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of in Judah. In Judah. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rock of the wild goat. And he came to the shepherd, uh, sheep's coat by the way where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the inside of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thy enemy into thy hand, that you may do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David rose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him because he has cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto the man, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing is the anointing of the Lord. So David stayed, uh, stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also rose afterwards and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou man's word? The men's words saying, Behold, David seeks thy hurt. 
Behold, this day thy eyes have seen how that the Lord has delivered thee today into my hands in the cave, and some bade me uh, kill thee, but my eyes spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth my hand against the against my Lord, and he is the Lord's anointed. And then uh, moreover, my father sees sees ye see the skirt of thy robe in my hand. In that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and kill thee not. Know thou and see there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou hatest my soul to take it. We took a different route. Another time David crept into Saul's camp while he was sleeping and looked at uh, the channel and a water jug that were inches from Saul in 24, 26, 7, and 12. From a distance, David was called, then called out to Saul, the Lord rendered that every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hands today, but I will not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as, life, as thy life was much set by this day, in my eyes, so let my life be much set by the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Verse 23, 24. David took the matter to God. David didn't seek vengeance, he sought God. Read the Psalms through verse 8, and you see a cry that David opposed to be disgraced, humiliated, uh, ashamed or ruined. And David expressed his anger and frustration to God, but he left the matter there. David surely knew what God said to the law, to me it be long with vengeance and recompense. For the Lord shall judge his people. That's Deuteronomy 32, 35 to 36. To whom do we turn when we face opposition and anger rises up? question. We may turn inward and fume about it. We may take our anger to others, recruiting them to join us in our anger. Excuse me. David's model is better approach. Take the matter to God, even though David often suggests to God on what he should do. He prayed and trust him and looked for his insurance. I am, I am thy salvation. Um, so what is your first reaction to these verses? Well, what I see is it's the right way and the wrong way. It's God's way is always right. I mean, always take it to God and can explain and explain your situation and then wait for his answer, you know, and don't, uh, uh, that's the right way and the other way is just blowing the top, you know. That way you just flame the fire of anger, you know. So um, it takes training too, you know, because we pop off a lot, you know, it takes training to uh, you know, just trust in the Lord. And then the more you trust in him, the more you see that he, he's going to be working on your behalf. Uh, and always listen to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will guide you. Uh, in that time, be prayerful, you know, and uh, and then uh, that will calm the inside instead of just pushing out. That doesn't do anybody any good. Psalm 35, 13 to 16. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer reaching returned into my own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavenly as one that mourns for his mother. But in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, they object gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. They did tear me and ceased not. With hypocritical mockers in feast, they gasped upon me with their teeth. 
It is wonderful to watch two people find each other and fall in love, but it is a shock to hear that just a few years later, one spouse turns to the other and say, I don't love you anymore. That's what a story, that's a story many people know by heart. Unfaithfulness and divorce rips families apart and those once loved and supported become enemies. It doesn't happen just between marriage couples, good friends, even best friends, turn their backs and begin to work against those they use to support through thick and thin. That's why David's situation was so hard. Those who sought to kill him were the very ones he cared for most. We already know the relationship between Saul and David. David served Saul faithfully. He has been a military leader for Saul and he has served alongside many of his soldiers who are now pursuing him. First Samuel 18, five. How would we respond well? How can we respond well when we are treated unjustly by others? And that, that's, that's hard, you know, as, uh, as you say, David, he was a military leader, he was in the military, he was worked with Saul. It's hard when people that are close to you do you unjustly. But you always got to seek God. Because it's uh, or the point of this whole lesson is take your anger to God and leave matters in his hands. So that's an answer I would say to that. Just get his answers, not yours. Because you, you're going to be hurt. And you're going to be boiling inside. But that's you know, the only response is to kind of let the Holy Spirit bring peace. Uh, and right decision to make. For those who think David was being unusually harsh in his Psalms, note that David sincerely prayed for these men. David wasn't guilty of casual prayers in passing. He didn't say, I'll pray for you and then promptly forget. For their sakes, he changed his clothes and imagine it's rather hard to forget to pray when your clothes and sackcloths are so richy. He fast, he mourned for them, he bowed down, he bowed down heavenly, his prayer was genuine. In an ideal setting, those David had previously prayed for and cared about would do the same for him when he stumbled. They wouldn't come alongside David praying, fasting, and seeking the best for him, but instead they rejoiced and gathered themselves against me. Others joined David, former friends, in this feeding frenzy object did tear me and cease not. When friends or family turn on us, it can be tempting to respond in kind. When friends or family turn on us, it can be tempting to respond in kind. When Jesus spoke of loving our enemies, he said, For if For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do you not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brothers only, what do ye more than others? Matthew 46 to 47. Even when our friends and loved ones turn on us, we don't change our tune. We are to continue loving. Jesus emphasized this for us. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He, uh, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is numb. So he opened not his mouth, Isaiah 53, 7. But God commands his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's Romans 5, 8. Loving those who anger us or seek our harm is the best way to get back at them. Uh, if thy enemy hungers, feed him. If thy thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil. Do not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans uh, 12, 20 to 21. That's powerful there. Psalms 35, 17, and 18. 
Lord, how long will thou look on and rescue my soul from their destruction, my darling, from the Lord? If I will give thee thanks to the great uh, congregation, I will praise thee among much people. Saul took his hatred of David into the battlefield. He responds as a warlord chasing the one he perceived to be his enemy to kill him. David was well known as a mighty warrior, but he appealed to God to be the warrior on his behalf. He was also, uh, he also appealed to God as his advocate, the judge. He, uh, he needed to be rescued from their destruction without God's intervention. David's life was truly in danger. David asked God to rescue my soul from the lions. The heart of David's prayer and the fear to God was for uh, rescue, not retaliation. Lead my cause with them that strive with me. Psalm 35, 1. Let them be confounded and put to shame. Verse 4. Uh, four. Let their ways be dark and slippery. Verse 6. Let destruction come upon him as unaware, verse 8. Their demise was not his goal. His rescue was David's attitude and heart toward his enemy with evidence at Saul's death. When Saul died in battle, First Samuel 31, 6. Let's look at that, First Samuel. First Samuel. Uh, First Samuel 31, 1 to 6. Now the Philistine fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistine fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistine followed hard upon Saul and upon his son, and the Philistine slew Jonah and Abinadad and Malchizia. Uh, Saul's son, and the battle went sore against Saul, and the archer hit him, and he was sore wounded and of the archer. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith. These, uh, these uncircumcised, uncircumcised, come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not. For he was so afraid, therefore Saul took the sword and fell upon it. Uh, and when the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise on his sword and died with him. So Saul died in his so Saul died and his three sons and armor bearers, all of his men the same day together. David did not rejoice, saying, yeah, my prayer has been answered. Instead, uh, David grieved for Saul as well as for Israel. 2 Samuel 1, 11, 12. 1 Samuel 1. Second Samuel one eleven twelve. Sorry, second Samuel. Then David took hold of his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even, until even, even for Saul and for Jonah, his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. We feel no retaliation or sense of vengeance when we grieve over the defeat of those who seek our downfall. David other Psalms reflect an unwavering trust in God as we will see in the next session study in Psalms 23. So we can assume David's uh, closing words in Psalm 35 reflect the same trust David would have faith that God would rescue him. He just I didn't know when. The Lord, how long will thou look on? David knew God would rescue him, but he was ready to be rescued right then. 
what makes leaving matter in God's hand so challenging? Mainly because we gotta wait on the Lord. We want it right away. We also see David trust in his praise of God. Things did not look favorable to David at that, this moment. He had not yet experienced the rescue he sought from God, but he approached life with a renewed determination. I will give thee thanks. I will praise thee. David had expressed similar praise in verse 9, but uh, here David would offer his praise and worship in the great congregation among much, much people to offer public, public praise in the thick of frustration, anger, provoking circumstances is a great testimony of our trust in God. Amen. That's important to your testimony. You know, people watching you. You know, when you say you're a Christian and you blow up like <laughs> that. So remember that too. In my early 20s, I worked in a pharmaceutical warehouse as operation manager. I lived with a order that came in late to the board supervisor who proceeded to tell me what she thought of this order and uh, what she thought of me. I just listened and then returned to my office. As I walked away, one man said, I want to know uh, what makes you different. I wouldn't blow up. I would have blown up if she talked to me that way. When we feel the tug of anger in our hearts, we can let loose and deal with the consequence later. Or we can give to the urge over to God and leave matters in his hands. Amen. You know, it's so much easier just to leave it in God's hands. It's not that easy as you say, but is the best way and it's the way God wants us to do, deal with it. So uh, this, these lessons are about what God wants us to do. So we we just don't read these, we have to apply them to our lives. And uh, so uh, uh, these are good lessons and important lessons. Why is it important to take our angry language to God? Because he knows best, he knows that he can defuse any problem we have, you know, and uh, we don't have to take it, and, uh, just work, get all worked up, you know, you just get all worked up, and uh, you're frustrated, the other person frustrated, and nothing, nothing gets accomplished, uh, so God's way, it will get accomplished, and be settled, you know, uh, and then uh, they got to engage says uh, this you can do during the week is choose one of the image that illustrates the common anger or frustration you have and write a prayer on a separate sheet of paper taking anger and frustration to God. So they give you some things like a flat tire waiting in the uh, line or a delay, flight to delay, you know. All these things are common things that happen to us and how we react. So uh, you can have a prayer written up. Okay, live it out. When anger begins to brew, how will you respond? Vent to God. Before uh, talking to others about what has upset you, talk to God. Be honest with God about why you're angry. Ask him for the strength to refrain from anger and then and the will to trust him with the situation. Well, that's important. Most of the time we think of other people want them to agree with them. You know? And that just hurts. The, that gets the other person all worked up and then also it's just not right. Take it to God. Seek resolution, not retaliation. If possible, find a way to resolve the relationship or situation that has angered you. At the very least, pray for the well-being of the other person. As you generally pray for another person, God will also work on your heart. Love, no matter what. Find specific, concrete ways you can show the love of Christ to those who hurt you or made you angry. Don't take any action to look for self-righteousness righteousness and better than 
the other person. Show love and honor that one who loves you. Amen. And Jesus loves us. So let's, yeah. so let's uh, listen for today. There's anger. And our next lesson will be overcoming the world. And uh, if you want to read that, that leads to Psalms 23, 1 to 6. So I thank you for joining us today. Let's end with, we're, uh, end with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you today thanking you for this lesson on anger. We thank you that, Lord, that teaches us to listen to the Holy Spirit, come to you, and uh, explain our situation to you so you can answer us through the Spirit, Lord, the right way you want us to go. Lord, we thank you for this, these lessons. And as we study them, Lord, uh, let us apply them to our lives, Lord, and uh, not just learn about them, but also apply to them, uh, that we may become stronger uh, Christians and following your will and not our will. We thank you for this day. We pray for all those people out there, Lord. Uh, we just pray for their safe, safety. We pray for our church family. We pray for those who are watching today. And we pray for, uh, Lord, uh, just our government. And uh, we pray that we get, be able to get uh, along with each other uh, much more, Lord. And, Lord, we pray for our families during this Christmas all day, Lord, we pray that you just uh, be strong, uh, that we be strong in the Lord, Lord, giving you your glory and your praise this Christmas. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's our lesson for the day. Have a Merry Christmas. We'll see you next week, next Wednesday, and have a great Christmas.